about 12 years ago, I decided to leave corporate America to raise my two kids who are now 14 and 11. And over that time, with regard to health care, the majority of what we do that's outside of the traditional, we have to go to the doctor for the, for the checkups and the well visits according to the school, is through my network of moms. But we're not very tech savvy. As she said, I just created a Twitter account yesterday and I still don't really know how to use it. Um, and in, during the 14 years through my husband's practice, I've seen tons of incredible ideas you know, fall into his uh, practice and he'll talk to us about it and I'll say, wow, that's great. Like we could really use that. You know, moms could really use that. How do we get that? And he'll say, well, we're marketing it to insurance companies or we're marketing it to the doctors or to these networks, but never write to the, the mom or the, the actual patient, the user. And over the years, it's been really interesting. Some of the ideas, they just fizzle because they're, no one knows about them. They're great ideas, I mean, but nobody knows about them. For some reason, healthcare is not able to utilize all this social media to get the stuff out there. So either one of a few things happens, either they dwindle or some big insurance company, payer they call them, will pick them up because it's a great um, ancillary product to add to their, um, their network, but then there's no one there to explain it to the, to the insured. And so it never gets used. And there, there's so many different different things out there. And I, I've had a very similar situation in the last um, couple of weeks. One of my son's teammates' father, who is 43 years old, was um, in San Francisco doing his third Ironman. Very fit. Goes to the doctor. Has access to the best health care. They eat well. You know the perfectly fit family, jumps into the water, has a heart attack. He would, ne his, even going to the doctor, there, there's nothing outward about him that the doctor would have said, you know what, I think you need to, we need to screen you for heart disease. And so then Jeff, um, David talked to Jeff about this idea and how they were going to talk about women's health, particularly heart disease, which of course I went on immediately and, and Googled and found out that it affects women as much as, as men. And so until now, I've really kind of fought social media like the plague because everything I do, I do from a mom's perspective. And so it's disruptive, it's, it overloads the sensory, it's not good for the kids, um, I don't have time. I mean, there's just a million reasons not to do it. But when we experienced this last week and we went to, to this guy's funeral, I realized that at some point somebody's got to go, okay, there's got to be a way through this social media that's affecting every other industry positively. There's got to be a way for us to access health care in a more efficient and preventative way. And so that's why I'm here. And so I've been asked to moderate a panel. I've, I've got some questions with me that my, some of the moms in my mom circle, when I said, uh, you know, I'm going to get to ask these questions, like all these emails of all these questions that we have that we go on Google and two hours later you don't have, you're not anywhere nearer to where you hoped you would be. So I'm going to go ahead and um, turn it over to the panel, let them introduce themselves to everyone, and then we'll get started with the questions. Is this working? Hi, my name is Tamara Hall. I'm a registered nurse, MBA, who's been in innovative healthcare now for about 25 years. And I'm one of those classic, what I call, sandwich people. I've been delivering healthcare, and I'm very excited with some of the innovations that are out there, but I'm also one of those that are dealing with an aging parent and kids and now grandchildren. And one of the biggest things that I find I get frustrated with is there's a lot of great information out there, but getting access, once you find the information or you know what it is that you feel is best for you or one of your loved ones, how do you actually make it happen in a way that's efficient, 
effective and can work around a very busy schedule. And then add to that Okay, um, and one of the very, oh, let's see, where was I here? Um, yeah, accessing information. But, and, but it, as a self-owned business, you're going to find that there's a lot of new and innovative things that are coming down the pike. Everything from the type of health plans that are going to be made available to people to the type of services that fit with a very busy and hectic life. And I'm very honored to be surrounded by such great, wonderful, innovative people. Yes, I am a new twit. Um, <laughs> I, I actually like that term. And, um, and hopefully I'll be tweeting with a lot of you. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm David Albert. I'm actually an Oklahoman. I live in the other city in Oklahoma, Oklahoma City. And uh, you know, you're very fortunate. You have two cardiologists who come from both the plumbing and the electricity side of cardiology up here, which is an interesting notion. So if anybody's having chest pain or feeling a little dizzy, we got, we got you covered. Uh, I just want to tell you, first of all, as long as you got money. Uh, now. These ladies are the chief medical officers of their family. That's what the Alpha Daughters are. That's what my wife is with my 87-year-old father-in-law, our children, married. We don't have grandkids yet, but she's hoping to get to it. Uh, I left academic medicine, and if you would, I have 3,400 Twitter followers, Dr. Dave O1. And uh, three years ago, I'm an inventor, I'm an engineer, I have 37 patents, I've started a lot of companies, and I made a four minute YouTube video, and I posted it, and two days later I had 200,000 views. And it was because I'd made an invention that turns an iPhone into an EKG machine, and now I got a company, we've raised lots of money. On Sunday I'll be with Sanjay Gupta on CNN, and I was in the Wall Street Journal this week, and next week, and a company called Alive Core, and we got an iPhone. And what's revolutionary about it is, that we're not just selling it to doctors or nurses, but we're selling it to patients. Today, in the United States, prescriptive. In Europe, starting next week, you could go into an Apple store or a Vodafone, that's their equivalent of Verizon or AT&T, and buy one. And you can record your own electrocardiogram and send it to whoever you want, your doctor, your mother, uh, not your insurance company, by the way. So. What I will tell you is I'm here because of social media. When I made that video, I had three Twitter followers. I had never made a YouTube video. Uh, I had probably 400 LinkedIn followers. I was in business, LinkedIn was the professional network. Facebook page had my family on it. So now I have 3,400 Twitter followers. I have 2,000 LinkedIn followers. Uh, LinkedIn connections. What I will tell you is, is that I am a huge believer and advocate, and unfortunately a pioneer in the area of digital health, and in empowering individuals to really take control of their own health. And I come from academic medicine, like my colleague, my new friend over here, and we're both being pioneers. Now, does anybody know what the definition of a pioneer is? We're in Oklahoma. People with arrows in their backs. Okay, those are pioneers, okay? We're in the land of the five civilized tribes, so as my good friends tell me, the unconquerable Chickasaws. I know that now because they got all the money. You drive anywhere around here, they got all the casinos and they're making all the money. So revenge of the red names is what we say here in Oklahoma. And it's, it's wonderful because, by the way, it's bringing health care. What the Indian Health Service could not do for the Native American, casino revenues are, and that is education, health care, empowering people to take control of the epidemic of diabetes and alcoholism and a lot of other things that afflict their DNA. Uh, and that's what we're learning. So what I will tell you is social media will be increasingly important 
You heard her talk about emails from the moms, the circles of moms. It will be tweets. It will be Facebook posting. I heard about this story. My company's headquarters, I live in Oklahoma City. My company's in San Francisco. And I heard about that young man. And I call him 43 is a young man to me. I'm 58. But that was a tragedy. The good news is, and there's very little good news out of that, is that the word of that tragedy spread. And maybe somebody was stimulated, like your brother, to go seek a screening. Now, what I'll tell you is people know about my device because probably the world's most famous cardiologist, a guy named Eric Topol. He was for 10 years the head of cardiology at the Cleveland Clinic, you know, U.S. News and World Report number one cardiology center in the world. And he was on an airplane last year, and he diagnosed a person with my device having a heart attack. Landed the plane, guy got a stent, saved his life. And he was the keynoter at what's called HIMSS, the big information healthcare meeting here last month. And as he was heading back two hours after he gave his keynote to back to San Diego, a woman was in distress and he diagnosed her on a plane as having atrial fibrillation. And as soon as he landed, he tweeted it, including her EKG. Didn't use her name, so it was HIPAA compliant. But that was the spread of social media. I don't pay him a dime. I've never given him a money, he's never asked for it. But he believes too that patients must become empowered and social media will be one of the important ways that we communicate with each other inside our circle of moms, inside our circle of friends, inside the same people who have the same problems. And so uh, I hope all of you will take that message back to your own families, be you the chief medical officer or whatever. Hi. I'm Craig Brandman. I am obviously in much better company than I deserve to be in. Uh, my wife reminded me of that when I told her I was coming over here to do this. It was her colleagues that Dr. Topol made this um, discovery on on the way back from HIMSS and when I told my wife that I was going to be on a panel with the uh, other cardiologists that developed this device, she said, you need to talk as little as possible <laughs> so that you can keep a secret that you are in over your head. But with that said, um, I am one of the co-founders. I'm a cardiologist. I don't practice anymore. Um, I am one of the co-founders of Step One Health. And as my two previous uh, panel members have alluded to, um, we are focused on empowering individuals who are ready to understand and own their own personal health care or the health care of their loved ones, as we talked about in terms of mostly the moms who are the sandwich generation and are managing their children and their, um, and their parents, and providing them with access to the information and tools and resources that are going to enable them to make the choices about what steps they take to achieve the goals that are personally relevant to themselves or to their loved ones. Um, and we start that by basically giving them access to getting lab work, their cholesterol values, their blood sugar values, whatever test they think is going to be helpful to expand their understanding of their health care without having to go to their doctors first. Um, there's no reason for it. They don't need to go to their doctors. There's additional time and expense associated with it. Um, once they get their lab values drawn at one of many draw centers across the country, we then deliver to them a personal health record. Um, that health record is owned by them. It's got information that is relevant to them or to whichever individual the tests were done on. And they can then take that information, get answers to any questions they have by talking to one of our medical team members, and then they can be prepared, if necessary, to go in and see their doctors, ask questions, and then make decisions as necessary to see what the next steps are that they want to take in their own care. And what Dr. Albert will tell you and what any clinician will tell you is that the most difficult thing for anybody that is working with patients, consumers, however we want to refer to them, is it's relatively straightforward to figure out what someone needs to do. 
what the next steps ought to be. The real challenge is getting them to comply and be successful in moving forward and putting that plan um, into action. And what I believe and what I think um, we are going to increasingly be able to demonstrate is that if that plan is a personal plan, not one that somebody basically said, you must do this, but if people are presented with a series of options, given access to the tools and resources to pick from those options and move forward with the things that they have selected are going to be helpful in terms of allowing them to achieve their goals, their compliance and their success and their overall well-being will be significantly improved. Jawbone up, and I, you're wearing one too, and I use a Nike fuel band. But let me tell you what those are really good for, motivation. The quantification is secondary to the motivation because what we really need to do, and politics aside, is what Michelle Obama said and move, not be stable, get our kids off the video games. I have two teenage boys. It's hard to get them out from behind the iPad, behind the Xbox, and get them out doing what I did because we didn't have any of that stuff back covered wagon days. Uh, but that's what we need to do. To your question earlier, there are some better sources, Mayo Clinic Online, a WebMD, that are not, uh, there are thousands of sources. Those two are decent, okay? They're, they're curated by people that know what they're doing. They understand the concept of liability, which is important. Um, nobody sues somebody who has no money, by the way. Uh, you only sue Willie Sutton's Law. The doctor could quote that in medicine. We know it. Why do we do some test? Why do we do something? Willie Sutton, bank robber in the 30s. The FBI caught him. Why did you rob banks? Because that's where the money is. Okay, so that's, go to those trusted sources. Of the devices, measure. Yes, your weight, your blood pressure. Yeah, they're digital ones. They're ones that go to your iPhone or your Android. They're ones that go through Wi-Fi and you can trend it, and that's all wonderful. We've made it easier. But by the way, you could do that with an Omron. You can buy a Walmart for 50 bucks and a pad and paper. It's not as slick, it's not as high tech, and I'm all about the tech, but it can be done. Motivation to do it, continuing to do it. Anybody here, I'm not gonna ask if anybody here is a diabetic, but you guys know that it used to be the only place you got blood sugar was at your doctor's office. Do you think anybody, any concept today that a mother of a di type 1 diabetic child or a type 1 diabetic would think about the fact that they couldn't have their own glucometer at home or even their own continuous Dexcom glucometer they, so they can see their blood sugars as they eat or not eat or whatever? So the concepts are personal empowerment, being able to get the technology. I'm not gonna say one's better than the other, but they'll motivate you to behave, and changing behavior is really the hard thing. Social media is where everybody becomes your coach. I have to just ditto one thing. He mentioned the motivation, and this looks like a very simple band, and I thought it was very techy and didn't, I guess, okay, what is this gimmick? But I sit, unfortunately, at a computer all day. And it's very easy for me to let four hours go by and not get up. And one of the simple devices that this band has is it'll vibrate. I can set it for every four to five minutes to vibrate if I've been inactive. And I'll be sitting there, and it just makes me conscious of just how inactive I am. Well, as he mentioned, there's several devices out there today. Nike makes one. This one is particularly made by Jawbone. And it can connect to your iPhone, now a droid. And it measures your activity. It measures your sleep pattern, and you can log your, you know, diet and nutrition and all that. It's amazing how something so simple, right, a reminder, which is moms, you're busy doing everything else. You are that device. You're like the very archaic form of that device where I was saying to Tamara earlier where you go up and talk to. You know, you're the reminder for everyone else. Oop, don't chew with your mouth open. You know, those types of things. So something so simple but really uh, amazingly necessary. Um, so my next question. That's right, and I will, trust me. 
Um, and we're, mind you, each other. I mean, I know you guys all have your own circles. You're each other's reminder. So, I mean, I get, I get a text all the time from one mom or the other, hey, do you need help after all with whatever? Or do you, does Jeff, my husband who's at home playing Mr. Mom right now, do we need to help Jeff with carpool? I mean, that, right? <laughs> I have a great mom circle, yes, which is all part of this because my mom circle and your mom circle and your mom circle, they need to come together because together, and I, this is what I was saying to Tamara earlier and to my husband, we are a powerful enough unit. We are the nucleus of all the little entities, and we, we should be able to affect and drive business and healthcare and force it into into being a better product for us. Um, so my next question is, so you guys have both spoken to some very simple things we can do, common sense things that you know we all know about, but for whatever reason, life gets in the way and we don't do. But there's the, there's the other side of stuff, like Sam's dad, my, this gentleman that you spoke of, the tri former triathlete. Um, what about what about not only being able to access, which you spoke to a little bit about, access these tests to um, give us a little bit of insight of what we might be at risk for? Not, it's great now we know we have somewhere we can go access them, but how do we know? How will we know which test is for what? So, you know, I have one mom that says, you know, I read this stuff on WebMD, and I think I have a thyroid issue. Like, what test do I, what test do I need? So they go to the doctor, they talk to the doctor, the doctor doesn't look at the information you spent 20 minutes filling out and asks you a couple of questions and then sends you somewhere to the lab and you're going, what, was this my thyroid? Because I just read online that I have all these things that are similar to a thyroid issue. Where, is there a way for us to know which tests we need to ask for or which steps we need to take to address our specific situation. So in this case, heart disease for Sam's dad or for Tammy, my friend, with who's certain she has a thyroid issue. I mean, how, where can we go and how can we access that information in, in mom terms? Well, I think that, you know, that's a really good question because Starting um, any process is, is really begun with the first step. Um, and so what we have built in is what we call a series of lab tests that are screening lab tests, that are um, a broad array of, of tests that cover many, if, if not close to all, of the issues that an individual might want to get information on, at least as a starting point. Um, this, you know, assumes that they are not dealing with any pre-existing medical condition that they know about. If they know that they're diabetic or they know that they've got some other health issues, then obviously there are different opportunities to get information about those specific conditions. But if they are, say, you know, a 40-year-old well mom um, that wants to basically understand um, if she is in fact got any risk factors that she may want to address. Um, one of the things that we were going to talk about today was the incidence of heart disease in women. Um, and the interesting thinking about that is that the disease, heart disease in women is the same disease in men as it is in women. The difference is, is the awareness amongst women as to the fact that they are just as much at risk to develop that disease as are their male counterparts. You know, most men know that they are at risk of developing heart disease. They know that there are the risk factors associated with it. And if they are, you know, if, if they are thinking about that, they know where they need to begin to adjust their lifestyle and, um, and other choices to mitigate some of those risks. You know, in, in, the, in the women's health world, there's been a lot of emphasis and thinking put on the concerns about breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and other very serious medical conditions 
but the media and until recently the healthcare community in general has been relatively silent about making women aware that they are as much at risk of developing heart disease as are their male counterparts. So in our screening test, which we encourage everyone to establish a baseline, because even if all of the tests are normal, then you at least know what your starting place is and you can compare that to any changes that may occur later in life, we can tell you if you have some of these early risk factors for the development of heart disease. And one of the stories that I like to share with people um, that came from our circle is um, a 27-year-old woman who lives in Texas who is thin and active. Um, and because she was involved with our circle of colleagues, decided to go and have her panel of lab tests done. And we had her do a pretty sophisticated test on her cholesterol values, a VO2 test, um, which is not very commonly done, but we think it's increasingly something that people ought to consider doing. And she came back with numbers which are the worst numbers I've ever seen in 30 years of being a cardiologist. Um, and she had no idea. Um, I had a conversation with her. We went through this. Um, she dealt with it in a very appropriate way, and we've begun to work on the things that she needs to do to mitigate these risks. This was a wonderful example of the value of getting access to this information when she had no idea that these things might turn up. It was entirely incidental. She had the opportunity to talk to Greg Hill, who is one of our medical team members. He's standing over there in the blue shirt. He's another one of my colleagues that makes me look smarter every day, um, which is a good thing. Um, and you know, we've taken this individual on the road to hopefully getting these risk factors under control and lengthening her life. So we've got resources. We encourage people to be proactive, get this information, and then we can figure out what the next steps are after that. I just happen to know, I think they were the, the, number, the third healthiest city in the nation. And a big part of the trend in Austin, which is where, I, where I'm from, is holistic approaches um, to medicine. So we, you know, there's a lot of the, you know, doing the blood work that tells us a whole lot about um, where we are, what's going on inside, and whether what our next steps need to be. But w is a lab work the only first step that we can take? Are there, are there holistic uh, or alternative measures that we can take? It's interesting. There's a, a big evolution happening in healthcare, and, and I would ask for a show of hands of how many of you in the audience have gone to either a naturopath or a homeopath or what some would term alternative medicine. And part of the reason or some of the thinking behind why this big evolution of that is it's a, it's a very hands-on and very uh, personal approach where due to the pressures of whether it's cost shifting and or just the complexities of our traditional healthcare system, it's become more mechanical and less personal. And so one of the things to think about as an individual is your relationship with whoever that health professional is who listens to you and works with you as a partner. And by the way, this is available in what I would call the more traditional American medicine. There's two um, fairly new practices that have evolved. How many of you have ever heard of functional medicine? It's actually a specialty. Um, and their premise is that they look at what is the cause of disease and what is causing your symptoms, not just treating and diagnosing and treating the symptoms. So they're very big into nutrition and assessing how you live in your lifestyle. The other um, avenue I would say you might want to investigate is called integrated medicine. And that is the practice of utilizing both alternative medicine or the term that some use alternative medicine, but homeopathic as well as modern testing medicine as a holistic approach, and they integrate the two. So oftentimes those practices will have a homeopath, they'll have a nutritionist or a dietitian, 
and a nurse practitioner and an MD all part of that practice? Well, you're, you're bringing up the crux of what I think has happened in the U.S. is people think that going to a doctor and getting a diagnosis is going to solve the problem. And it is just literally the answer of the problem. And only you can truly heal thyself, and that means acting upon what you know and learning more about what you can do. And I hate to say it comes down to just the basics of nutrition, activity, and believe it or not, sleep. And um, Cheryl mentioned this <laughs> earlier today, something as simple as drinking more water or something as simple as every 45 minutes getting up and walking around for 10 or 15 minutes just to circulate your blood flow. And so uh, there are easy steps, and I would encourage people to venture out, and this is, again is where technology and the evolution of the Internet have made health alternative health professionals, uh, dietitians, nurse practitioners, health coaches, that you can connect with that can help guide you on what are some simple things you can physically do um, versus assuming the, the health professionals and the doctors are going to be the solution. They're just letting you know what's wrong. You're the solution, and you have to take that active role. On, um, on the My Med Lab uh, website, um, there is information there that basically describes in some significant detail um, what each of the lab tests basically provides information about, um, uh, what diseases um, are going to basically be, um, what that information is going to provide versus very different kinds of um, disease processes which you may be concerned about. And we also have a panel of experts which we encourage people to talk to after they've had lab tests done to understand what those questions are that they might have that they don't know the answers to before they may or may not go to their doctors. But those experts are also available to talk to you before you have your lab tests done as well so that you can ask them questions about what there may be what you know what the resources are to get you answers for the questions that you might have. Upsies on 18-year-old soldiers in the Vietnam, and they found extensive coronary disease. And so we know that plaque starts very. And uh, there are some beginnings of pediatricians advocating that we start doing lipids in children. Yeah. It's all kinds of tests. Y cholesterol, triglycerides, HDL, LDL, and the ratio of those, the so-called good and bad cholesterols. Blood pressure. I have a son, he's a medical student, so I'm going to disclose. He has hypertension. He started blood pressure medicine when he was 20 years old. He's really healthy. You saw him, you'd think nothing, right? We have a family history. I take blood pressure medicine. My dad took it. His 92-year-old brother takes it. So family history is important. That's where, you know, the problem we face today is, and by the way, I was going to talk about homeopathy. I come from one of the most subspecialized areas of medicine, cardiac electrophysiology. We have all kinds of very expensive high-tech gizmos. But what we discovered that was just presented at the American College of Cardiology is that yoga is very effective at treating atrial fibrillation. 